Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for being here this evening with us. Uh, my name is Vasundra, and uh, I'm here today as someone who's deeply admired, uh, admiring uh, Nirupa's botanical illustration work and have been, um, you know, an ardent follower of her journey in this uh, space. Uh, and that's really why I'm here this evening. Uh, and I've also had the opportunity to meet Suniti many times with Nirupa. And uh, this makes it a deeply personal thing for me as well to be here um, at, the, um, at the release of Hidden Kingdom. Um, see, I've been a habitual tree hugger since the time I was a little girl. And the trees around me have meant a whole lot uh, because of where I grew up and because of my surroundings, because of the people that instilled a whole lot about how trees impact our everyday life and our being. Um, and so when Nirupa started to uh, illustrate trees in this much of amazing detail, it became something that I was you know, deeply affected by. It was something that I really... Uh, wanted to be somehow a part of, and this opportunity has al allowed me to be a little part of her journey. Um, we live in interesting and challenging times. Uh, the very fact that all of you are here at BIC this evening um, indicates to me that you know what I'm talking about. Our world today is driven by economics and economies and very little else seems to be at the forefront of the minds of people who make decisions for our collective uh, existence. And with this in mind, you know, it brings me to question how much we as a population that lives in this world at this moment value um, intangibles like memories like um, stories, stories of our collective heritage, and how this fleeting reality of economics and economies is going to pave the way forward for all of us as a civilization. And at this time, it's so poignant that we have uh, books like the ones that Nirupa has illustrated, um, and definitely the one that we are talking about today, Hidden Kingdom, uh, which I feel are so timely because, you know, it brings us back into what I call bot our botanical heritage, which doesn't really take up uh, a place of priority or precedence over very much else. We're talking about a time from personal experience where um, I, f over the years, felt deep senses of loss when I see... Um, you know, wa driving in from the airport, the loss of our green cover as we come into the city that used to be Garden City. Um, when, when I see the big uh, monolithic rock that has now become a sliver on my way in from the airport every time I come home, and I question this very concept of home when I see that. Is this really my home? Um, when I am asked by colleagues and friends if I will come and stand with them in protest of uh, infringements of our precious Cubbon Park, for instance. You know, these are things that really make me question what, what do we see in our future? How do we see this going forward? But, you know, and, and also to read uh, uh, in the newspaper that we're paving a huge highway through our precious Western Ghats. I think it's really a, a deep um, point in our collective history that we need to uh, bring back our attention to what's really important. And at this particular time, for me, you know, um, I found Nirupa, and she's on this amazing journey that's a little bit common to mine. It's a bit shared. It's a collaborative journey that she's on with Suniti, 
uh, Siddharth and Prasenjit. <clears throat> and uh, to kind of draw parallels to my world, the work that I do is something akin to that in the sense that we build bridges, bridges of communication. We build bridges using a different medium, whether it be artistic or not, in my case, more musical. Um, and this deep sense of collaboration or the concept of inclusion is something that really drives what I do as well. And I, when I read Hidden Kingdom, I got a sense of the exact same thing, but they were doing it uh, in a slightly different way. They were talking about something that we take for granted, all of us, trees. These amazing species of trees that we don't uh, see maybe, or we can't name most of the time. But then there they are. They've been there. They've seen generations of us pass by. And yet, in a heartbeat, we can destroy them. So um, this journey that Nirupa, Suniti, Siddhartha, and Prasenjit are on is deeply collaborative and is deeply, you know, is coming from a space where um, this means a whole lot to them. They've grown up uh, around trees. It's, it's something that, that we have all taken for granted through our years. So without really talking too much more about the context and the point in time when we are here, to talk about the Western Ghats and the beautiful ecosystems and the trees that inhabit them, I'm going to start to talk about how this journey really came about. Um, so it's exactly as you said. Um, we've been spending a lot of time in the Western Ghats as kids because that's what our parents uh, grew up with and that's what they wanted to pass on to us. And I know that as adults, that's where our love for nature comes from. And I realized that that's not something that a lot of people have had. Um, and so I'd come across a quote by a science writer named um, British Monbo sorry, he's a British science writer named George Monboyot a few years ago. And he was lamenting the fact that year upon year, we seem to be growing further and further away from nature. So he wondered uh, what would happen if an entire generation was disconnected from nature. Would they have that same sentiment? And would they attempt to uh, save nature when we needed it the most? And you know, around the same time, I was working for a publishing company in London called Bloomsbury, so in the children's department, and they published the likes of Harry Potter. And they'd imbued all of their books with that same sense of magic. Um, so they had books in collaboration with the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, and they had books in collaboration with the London Zoological Society. Um, and I just really wish that we had had that something like that growing up that had taught us about where we lived. Um, you have to question, so many of us have this sense of nostalgia for the English countryside without ever even having been there necessarily. And where does that come from? It comes from books, right? Um, and like, if you've grown up in a staple of Enid Blyton, the likelihood is that you'll be more familiar with blackberry brambles and badgers than champaka trees and minas. Um, so really, Hidden Kingdom is an attempt to address that, rectify that, and uh, since many of us didn't have it in our childhoods, it's, it's pe for people of all ages. So really, yeah, okay, so speaking of the chronology, in 2016, we applied for this um, National Geographic Young Explorers grant, and we put together the team, as, as you mentioned, collaboration was really important to us, so I wanted to bring experts on board. I didn't just want this to be uh, something that I did on my own off the internet. Um, so it was me with illustration, and um, Suniti, my sister, who did the writing, and my cousin Siddharth Machado, who is a botanist, and he uh, fact-checked the whole book, and he was really instrumental in uh, helping us pick the species and um, go on our expeditions and everything. And my friend uh, Prasenjit Yadav, who's a photographer, and uh, he basically documented this whole process for us. So what is your background? Are you, you know, did you study botany or are you like... 
So neither of us, yeah, neither of us are trained botanists or scientists. Siddharth is. Uh, Nirupa studies sociology, and I work in branding. But it was largely through this medium of botanical illustration um, that you know the Western gods started to become so real to us. Um, we've been going year on year for field trips, or I mean road trips with our family. But all of a sudden, you know, this the undifferentiated mass of green started to morph into plants and and that really seem to have an identity, a life, a character of their own. Um, yeah, plants have always kind of been on our radar, so to speak, because um, we, on my mom's side of the family, we have a, a lot of botanists in the family. So her uh, uncle, Father Cecil Saldana, was actually the first to document the flora of Karnataka back in the 70s. And he used my grandfather's house in Hassan as his base. So my mom, who is in this picture here, um, and who's also there, uh, she has memories of watching this entire expedition unfold. And consequently, we've come to, you know, we have that, that image in our minds of, of plants, and we associate them with adventure and discovery and excitement. But I know that that's not a sentiment that a lot of people share. Um, and so, but we, I mean, I really do think that maybe if, if uh, we people come to understand their complexity and this book can perhaps uh, serve as that Uncle Cecil in their lives and be that springboard from which they can discover the natural world for themselves. Yes, I, I totally agree. For me in my life, really, it was a lot of time spent uh, on the... Uh, in the campus of the Indian Institute of Science where my mom worked. And, you know, before uh, I knew much about life or anything else, I knew uh, botanical names of trees because they had little boards all over campus. So it's really, you know, we, some of us have these lucky uh, chances in life, you know, to have uh, uh, deep influences like this as we're growing up. Um, but why plants in particular? you know, not animals, why, you know? Yeah. Um, I think if you ask a kid, you know, what their favorite cartoon character is, what their favorite car is, you know, what their top three animals are, I think they'd rattle one after the other off the top of their head, but you ask them what their favorite plants are, and it's possible that they draw a blank. And, I mean, I think even what about us? The next time you're stuck in traffic and, you, you know, you, you have the chance to look outside and see how many cars you can identify the brands. But then take it one step further, and then, you know, if you look at the trees around you that are on the side of the road, and see how many of those you identify, and you'll soon realize what it is we're kind of prioritizing these days. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely that, that was one of the main reasons that we wanted to make the book educational. Like, um, even despite the fact that I'm a painter, I didn't want it to just be a showcase of all of my the paintings, you know, I didn't want it to be a, a book of pretty pictures. I wanted it to have that informational content so that uh, people can start to get into the the actual individual identities of these plants. Um, because I think in our, in our modern world, we, we've gone to the stage where we seem to be taking plants as just the background scenery to our lives, you know, like the, just the decor at our weddings. A little weddings. bit like what's happening with music. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> it's kind of the soundtrack of our lives now, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the, the decor at our weddings or the background music in the elevator, or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, and even, in, even if it's a wildlife picture, usually you'll have the, the tiger up front, um, and then the, the plants are just the supporting scenery, right? Uh, but if you actually think about it, plants are the, they're the starting point of our ecosystems, the fundamental block, building blocks of all life, and the reason why the Earth is habitable for, this, for life to this day. And we still seem to uh, view them as these passive creatures, robbing them of their agency. But uh, if, you, if you get into the, the stories of how these plants actually behave, you'll realize that there's so much intricacy and complexity there that we're just completely overlooking. Um, so I'll, let me just show you one of the um, paintings from the book where we decided to kind of just flip things on its head. Um, these are the Maristica swamps. They're a wetland habitat that you can find um, along the west coast of India. And you, you have these um, monkeys there, the lion tail macaques, which you can see in the background. And they're endemic to the, to the Western Ghats, which means that they can't be found anywhere else in the world. Um, but at the same time, the plants that you see in the foreground, uh, they're a species of wild nutmeg, and they're called Maristica, and the, the plants are named, the swamps are named after them. 
Um, and they also can't be found anywhere else in the world. So we, we just decided to flip things on its head and have the plants in the foreground and the animals in the background just for once. <laughs> yeah. Speaking, you know, did you actually go to these places? Because, you know, that's the first question my mom asked me when we were looking at, you know, all these uh, beautiful paintings. She was like, but that looks a little unreal, she said, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the paintings definitely have a kind of surreal quality because um, I, I, I didn't want them to just be photorealistic because then what would be the point? We may as well just uh, use photos. But we did uh, visit the, the, the Western Ghats quite a bit. The National Geographic grant allowed us to uh, go out in search of these plants and uh, Praseen Jeet photographed that whole process, so I'll just show you. Um, this is us in the same um, swamp the same swamps that I showed you just before this. Um, and this is me sitting in the center of a strangler fig tree that, with the hollowed out bark of it. And um, this is us uh, near Chikmagalur, in <laughs> which Manu uncle may recognize. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we did definitely go there. And then the whole process actually allowed us to um, select the plants that we thought would be representative of the area and that we also thought would have a great story to tell. Speaking of stories of these plants, what was your approach to the text in this book? So <clears throat> for the text, I think it was really important for us that the education aspect came through as much as the aesthetics. And very quickly, we realized that rhyme was sort of the way to do that because uh, we did a bunch of experiments with kids and we, we realized that there was a momentum to rhyme and the way that, you know, they just wanted to know more, they were able to memorize facts and it was really a way to distill very complex scientific technical information into a fun, accessible format um, and something that not only people can understand but also hopefully enjoy. Mm. You mean rhythm? Rhythm, rhyme, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. you know all about that's, that. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. kind of, <laughs> that hits really close to home for me these days. <laughs> um, but uh, Suniti, why don't you read us something from what you've written in the book? Sure. Um, so I'm going to read something from one of the introductory passages. And just to give you a little bit of context, the narrator of the story is uh, the Indian honeybee. And we chose this protagonist because it, we thought it would be fun for the, the honeybee to kind of show us, show us its world and introduce um, that to us. And of course, he kind of sets the scene and he says, you know, look at the superstars, there are the animals and the birds and all of that. But then please pay attention to the plants because they're the kind of the silent secret heroes on the scene. And they're, they're doing their work and that's really important to notice. So that's what this passage is about. Spectacular, spectacular, big cats, great tusks. Showmen and stars of all kinds. A plus for glamour, yet a moment to consider. Plants are discreet masterminds. Ingenious producers for all living beings. As food factories go, plants are best, I attest. But besides generosity, they have spunk and tenacity. Creatures like all the rest. In forests alive with competitors and predators, our hustlers adapt to survive. You'll balk, gasp, and chuckle at the tricks they evolve to spread seed, branch out, and thrive. Tough is the fight for space and sunlight in a tropical ecosphere. But when plant life nourishes, the kingdom just flourishes, and boy, it's a jungle out here. <laughs> so to <laughs> to me, that immediately makes it accessible, you know, because when you read in rhythm and rhyme, then it, it uh, transcends age uh, and you get a whole lot across. Um, but coming back to you, Nirupa, what is your artistic process? You know, for me, the thing that just spellbinds me is your attention to detail. And when I look at a tree, uh, that you've uh, painted, I feel like I've never seen it before until I've seen your painting. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> really <laughs> quite a statement. Um, but actually, that is the intention because I think that, um, you know, animals in a way are something that they're more relatable to us because they have a face, they move like us. Um, and so 
we, we find them, we, we see all of their sort of familial relationships that echo ours. But plants, on the other hand, seem to be uh, something that are, are quite uh, remote. We don't seem to connect with them in the same way. So I, I do believe and hope that through botanical illustration, you, you're kind of providing a human face to something uh, that you wouldn't otherwise understand. And perhaps people can see it through my eyes. Mm. Um, the medium itself is watercolor. Um, so everything is hand painted and then scanned uh, and then Photoshop and Illustrator. That's basically it. Yeah, you've got a long line of people who want your originals. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, can you show us a few spreads of the book? Yeah, um, okay. So this one is um, a species from the ficus family. That's the scientific name for fig. Um, it's very common, you'll find it even in cities. In fact, I've seen it at the uh, Indira Gandhi Memorial Park. Um, it's called gular, uh, and colloquially, and then the, the scientific name is Ficus racemosa. So it's the same genus as banyan trees, people trees, and the common fig fruit that we eat. Um, what's really cool about figs is, and what's really important about them is that their fruit can kind of be found all year round, um, as opposed to a lot of other plant species, which fruit only in particular seasons. So even in lean times, animals and birds can rely on the fig fruit. Um, but what's actually even weirder about them is that they're pollinated by fig wasps. And usually every species of fig will have a corresponding species of wasp that it works with and nothing else. So if you think about it, that tiny little wasp is so central to that whole ecosystem. And if that disappears, then the fig disappears. And it has that snowball effect on the entire animal kingdom. Yes. And for us, we felt like there were lessons on many levels. Um, and you know, to use a line from the book, it says, you know, maybe the wasp isn't all that humble because we have it to thank for the biggest tree in the jungle. And I think, you know, the way that we look at it, and if you look at plants, uh, the, li the lives of plants as a, as a metaphor for our own lives, you realize that dependency is super desirable, but it also makes things very fragile. And therefore, we have to work really hard to protect it. Yeah, so um, and that's why in the book also it was really important to us to, to show those interactions. We didn't want to just show the plants in isolation. So um, the, those plant plant on plant interactions and plant on animal inter interactions are sort of a theme throughout the book. Um, even even I think this. Yeah. So the oops, let me just go back. Yeah. So this is the the cover image of the book. Um, it's called an elephant foot yam. And actually, um, a lot of people here may find it familiar because its tuber is eaten in villages across India. Um, but the flower is really fascinating. It's huge, first of all. Uh, and it is pollinated by dung beetles. And it, so what it does in order to attract these pollinators is it emits this foul smell of rotting flesh. It's basically trying to trick the beetles into coming there to lay their eggs. Um, and so uh, the beetles will recognize the, the deception and they'll move on, but the flower's work is done because it'll carry the uh, pollen along with it. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lovely paragraph at the end of the book that speaks to these interactions, isn't there? I mean, yes. can you? Yeah, so we conclude by the book by showing these interactions, which are, you know, it also speaks to the cooperation as well as the competition between animals, plants, birds, insects, and all of that. So the line, uh, this, the paragraph goes something like this. One thing's for sure, life's complex out here with its savage yet beautiful bends. But wherever you live, take this to heart. We get by with a little help from our friends. So can you show us one more image? I think this is it. This one? Or there's another one? <laughs> um, this is the last image in the book. It's the Nila Kurinji flowers, which, um, I mean, that's where the Nilgiris get their name. Um, so when they, they, they're famous for the fact that they, f they blossom in unison once every 12 years. And then when they do so, they cover the entire hillside in carpets of blue. Um, the, we all know this, but don't necessarily know the reason behind it. Um, so the reason is that it's employing a reproduction strategy known as gregarious flowering, um, by which it invests all of its resources into this single flowering event. 
um, and it's it, to attract pollinators to the feast because the pollinator, pollinators literally can't see anything else but Nila Kurinji. Um, so the the Indian honeybee is actually that's that's how we end the book. He's like, okay, you know, uh, peace out. I'll see you later. I'm gonna I'm gonna stay here. Um, and yeah, that's it. Um, I want to take uh, a moment also to. Um, um, you know, to me to mention Siddharth and Prasenjit again, without whom, uh, you know, this wouldn't have been possible. Are they here today? Um, so Siddharth is actually doing his PhD uh, in Florida, so uh, he couldn't he couldn't be here. His parents are here. His parents though. are here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 And uh, Prasenjit is actually on, a, he's also a National Geographic grantee, so he's on assignment in the Himalayas, and uh, he pretty much disappears for six months at a time, and you don't hear from him. <laughs> yes. And with that, uh, I'd like to open uh, uh, you know, a Q&A session, if anyone has anything in particular to ask uh, Nirupa and Suniti. Can we have a mic over there, please? Hello, 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 hello. Wait, let me put the picture up. <laughs> hello. This this wasn't a planned. Okay, <laughs> we didn't ask him to do this. So I suppose I am my father's daughter. I really can't help this one. So listen up, everyone. Have it up in just a sec. So this is the devastating Hello. fig tree, and I'm going to just tell you its story, so uh, listen carefully, it's quite interesting. While figs do cooperate, they also compete, as the laws of the jungle imply. When tree canopies are high, clever schemes they must... <laughs> Canopies are high, clever schemes they must try for their young ones to reach for the sky. Like most plants, they need light to grow and energize, but the climb to the top takes years. So when birds drop fig seeds on branches of tall trees, a sinister spectacle occurs. The fig seed starts to grow from the host tree's branches, a feverish chase for sunlight while sending its roots down to the ground to wrap the host tree's body up tight. An embrace so complete, deadly at worst, a takeover, trunk, branch, and twig. It's earned our guy a killer reputation. We call it the strangler fig. Any other questions, observations, anything? Hi, and congratulations on the book. It's fascinating. I told Nirupa I bought the book originally to gift it, and I've just kept it. Um, one question I had for you, um, currently it, it feels more like a coffee table book. Mm -hmm. And you know, stemming from where you originally thought of the idea about you know spreading the the anim i mean the plant kingdom to you know the younger generation is there any plan of actually making it a children's book taking it to that level uh, i would love you know for it to actually have yeah. So actually, yeah. So one of the next steps for this book is for us to be able to translate um, the book into regional languages of the Western Ghats, for us to be able to distribute it uh, in schools for kids in the Ghats as well. So that's one of um, our, our re one of our kind of game plan, next move sort of thing. But I think for us, when we put this together, we wanted it to be, we, we kind of mentioned it for uh, as people for eight and above. So uh, we wanted parents to be able to kind of read it to their kids. And uh, because it's complex information, I think all of us know a little bit about photosynthesis, but we've all kind of forgotten the rest of it. So we really wanted it to be something that kids and parents can read together and appreciate and kind of, um, so, so that it's attractive for, for sort of all generations, but yeah. I think the, the rhyming aspect of you know, the writing is quite accessible to children. 
and also the fact that uh, you know there's an index in the end that's very useful for some of us that might have forgotten some basic botanical concepts. So, um, sure, actually, that's yeah. what I was coming to. Like, I mean, reading it, I realized you know the interaction between the plants, the the parasites on it, you know, that kind of that whole ecosystem was very well, you know, brought out, uh, not just in diagram, but even in text. Uh, so I enjoyed that. And like I said, it was hard. It, it is hard to let go. I haven't, I still haven't gifted it. <laughs> Thank you. We're actually working with uh, in, uh, another um, organization where they, uh, they're trying to all, uh, create an entire module out of it that kids can uh, take out into their gardens and, and use it. It'll have a lot of uh, um, additional stuff surrounding it. Because the content, like it, plant information is quite complex. So uh, it, re it requires a certain baseline at least, yeah. I thought I saw another hand here. No. Thank you. Um, I mean, it's it's really amazing. Um, and my question was about collaborating with scientists. Um, you know, you you think that collaborations between art and musicians and nature conservationists would be common, but it's really not. And you've done it twice with Pillars of Life and this. And I was wondering whether you could comment um, on your experience. Um, because I'm just thinking there must have been really interesting conversations around fact and fantasy and, and all of that. So I'd be really curious. Yeah, um, you know, I, I really think that one of the, re from, from working on this book, I've realized um, that one of the reasons, in my opinion, that collaboration doesn't happen as often is if you have a four people team, you have to split the, I'm being really candid, but you have to split the profits among four people. And uh, the way that the book industry works in India is that the margins on books are really small. So in, uh, no publishing house is going to go in for that, and uh, so which is why we decided to self-publish the book as well. Uh, it's a hell of a lot of work, but we thought that this was the only way that we could actually do justice to it, because I don't want to just get information off Wikipedia. Anyone can do that. I wanted to work with scientists, and I want to pay them as well, because it, this is their... their um, knowledge that they've gleaned over so many years, and they deserve that, right? Um, and that the, this world of science kind of tends to, they, they're doing their own thing. In, in, in actual fact, they're doing most of the groundwork, but the rest of us don't know what's happening, right? So this is our, like basically doing, yeah, it's a bridge, exactly. Um, and uh, that is even, th even the first book, Pillars of Life, that was also self-published, and then I, this is my opinion, at least. Did she answer you? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, any other questions? Thank you. The book is beyond beautiful. So I have a small observation. Uh, you were mentioning about where it's going with music. Um, but also, from the time that we are very small, we've had our parents uh, or your grandmother sing to us uh, maybe rhymes, and they could be in the, you know, within the context of a very small area. So, Vasundra, then, are you aware of any rhymes in Canada or around here which revolve around trees, which may have been, and if that could be uh, something that we could do, I, I because you said children. <laughs> They learn very quickly when yes. it is sung to them or it's a rhyme. And the childhood memory is very strong. You hear something when you're three, you never forget it, really. Yes, yes, that's true. Actually, uh, you know, I don't know how many of you might remember this. Bela gulab jool, champa chameli. You know, these kinds of songs do, do exist. And uh, in fact, of late, I've been uh, sort of going back and trying to uh, learn, uh, relearn Sanskrit, you know, from a a spoken point of view. Uh, and there is a, a lot uh, in the written word in Sanskrit uh, text, uh, which, you know, there are, there are verses and verses uh, describing characters in natural surroundings. You know, there are, I remember reading uh, uh, a piece out of Meghadutam where, you know, there's a huge description, pages long description of the creeper behind the, you know, the, the main character and how it reflected on 
the situation that she was in. So a lot of nature play has happened in our literary, traditional literary text, whether poetic or uh, uh, otherwise. Um, it's just a question of us then going back and bringing it out. Uh, definitely point uh, taken. <laughs> but uh, they're already sort of on the first step of trying to do something through painting and, uh, and sp spoken word uh, poetry. Uh, so I think, yes, this is definitely a wonderful way forward to kind of reconnect with who we are, uh, even in the context of our natural surroundings. Anyone else? Okay, I'm, I'm not going to hog this <laughs> mic. <laughs> Just one thing I wanted to, you know, point out and bring out that, you know, I have three kids um, of the teenage and younger, and I and I realized that I, I love the way you've taken nature and made it almost like fantasy-like. Um, you know, it's so hard for us to, you know, take our kids back from fantasy to real. So this is a lovely, uh, lovely thing put together that, you know, bridges those two that gap, or, you know, so it's, it's absolutely lovely. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. One more comment. I'm not very sure if I'll be able to express myself the way I would like to, but I know that I've always loved nature, plants, trees, probably just like anybody and maybe a little more. But since this book, mm. the impact it's had on me is something I'm not able to uh, fully, like, shall I say, I'm still not, I'm, I've still not reached a point where I can say, uh, oh, this is like complete, because it isn't. Now, every time I see a plant, a tree, or I've been to Lalbagh a million times, did not have the same impact as when I went with Nirupa a few months ago. I looked at all of those trees so differently. Mm. I saw them as old men. I just thought of them as like a tiny seed. Who planted that seed? It just kind of really um, played with, with my imagination. When did this start? And look at that tree now. And then I feel it now when I like what probably I would not have felt as much with as much intensity as when they say they're cutting this tree and this and that, I want to hit out. Yeah. Like, and that's the effect this book has had on me. Nothing to do with those two girls there being my daughters. <laughs> <laughs> Could have left that out. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. I think uh, we're out of time. Alok, are you t keeping time or are you lost? <laughs> I, I forgot to tell him, sorry. I forgot to tell him. OK, uh, do we have time for one last question, if anyone has one? Thank you. Um, I'd just like to hear you speak a little bit about the artistic process, the actual process of painting these things. So the piece behind you really struck me when you showed me the book when we first met a few days ago. And, and I echo your mother's comments about this thing being alive on the page. There's an essence of something there. There's a being that, that jumps out. So I'm looking at that. There's so much detail in there. It blows my mind. Where do you even begin? to create a piece like that on the page? I mean, could you just talk a little bit about that process? Um, so with trees, it's actually quite, a, quite an involved process. It's really difficult to uh, photograph a tree, because especially when it grows in the rainforest, because you have, um, first of all, those trees are so tall. You know, try getting that into one camera frame, and it usually doesn't fit, or you have a hell of a lot of surrounding canopy uh, that makes uh, the, the tree practically invisible. Um, so with all the trees, I have to stand there in person and sketch it. And so I, I think that speaks to the fact that it breathes life into the painting because you, act, you, you gain an intimacy with the tree. Like even if I go back to the Western Ghats now, I'll, I'll know which tree I sketched, you know, in, in the individual specimen. 
um, and uh, you'll s and you see so much happening. Like you'll see the the little giant squirrels playing on on the branches, and you realize that that's an entire world that's yeah. going on up there. Um, and so then I yeah I make sketches and then I bring them back to uh, Bangalore and uh, through a combination of memory and photographs. Um, I, I start, and then, I mean, these kinds of paintings take really long. Uh, you'd be surprised that the flowers are actually relatively simple, and then it's the leaves that take the longest, because that's the powerhouse of the, f of the plant. So you have to show all of those veins and everything, and, and this is full of leaves. So this one took, I guess, maybe three weeks, I think. Yes, and if you're, if you're, if you're doing, if you're sketching like a really tall tree, even if you're standing right in front of it, you might not be able to see the whole thing um, yourself. So you'll actually um, study the buttress up close, and then you'll climb up the, the top of the hill to see the crown rising above the canopy. And actually, what's in between, you don't know. Um, that's where the botanist comes in. If, if it were up to me, I, I, I would put anything in between, you know? But the botanist is the one that tells you that this is ordinarily what this species would look like. So it's, that collaboration is vital. Thank you all uh, for your amazing questions. Oh, there's one more. Uh. So uh, just to wrap up, um, I have, uh, so for everybody who doesn't know, I'm Nirupa's husband. Um, and I've watched this uh, unfold for about four years now, and the amount of effort uh, that has gone into it, she has never had any doubt in her ability to portray uh, how magical uh, trees and nature is, but she's had a lot of doubt in how it will be received. Uh, yeah. And, you know, uh, self-publishing it, uh, running around, uh, trying to make sure everything is right. How do we price it? The market is so uh, fickle nowadays with respect to, like, do people really buy books anymore? It's an Instagram generation. Everybody just wants prints. Uh, you know, how do we make sure that we pack it where there is no plastic, there's no uh, waste? Every single thing she's given, both of them have given so much thought to. And adding to the fact that Nirupa isn't trained in any kind of fine art, and Suniti isn't trained in any kind of writing. And to put out a project like this, their first project at this quality and at this level, I'm biased, of course, uh, makes me extremely proud. And thank you, all of you, for the love that you've shown the book to be here today. And all I ask is you please spread the word. Thanks. Thanks, Alok. With that, another thank you from us for up here, for being here, for taking, taking the time out to come here and uh, delve a little deeper into what went on before this book arrived. So thank you once again. And th uh, thank you from <laughs> our end to Vasindra, who literally uh, drove in from Mysore today specifically for this and got out of the car, put on a sari and <laughs> came here. Uh, and of course, thank you to the BIC. Thank you to the BIC. God knows Bangalore needs this. So, and thank you to everyone for coming. <laughs>